Welcome to the MOOC's course in Organic Chemical Technology. The title of today's lecture is Paints and Pigments. In the last lecture, we started discussing about the surface coating industries. So, we have seen what are the different types of surface coating industry products, what are their constituents, what for they applied and then each constituents, what is the role of a given particular constituent and those kind of things we have seen. Then we have seen that paints is primarily having a vehicle which is a liquid portion and then a pigment which is a, a finely divided solid. So, then paint uh, in a uh, crude way we can say that a finely divided uh, pigment solid is dispersed in a liquid vehicle, right. So, then it is mixed in a mixed thoroughly and then the dispersion has to be uniform that is how we can uh, say crudely. Again for uh, pigments extenders are there, fillers are there, for the liquids then oils, dryers etc. are also there, those are all ingredients etc. their roles we have seen. So, primarily what we have seen from previous lecture is that paint is nothing but a uh, proper thoroughly mixed uh, liquid and uh, finely divided solid, right. So, dispersion whatever is formed that is the paint that is how we can say. So, now we are saying when we are saying it is a mixture of uh, liquid and then uh, finely divided solids. So, the paint formation process is nothing but a uh, unit operation only, mixing only occurring only mixing is occurring in the paint formulation. But before paint formulation whatever the pigments that you wanted to manufacture there are some chemical reactions. So, there are some unit processes, right. After uh, paint formation when you apply on a structure or on a surface then it has to dry. So, then for the drying or hardening of these layers, paint layers you know uh, some kind of oxidation and polymerization reactions occurs those things also we have seen. So, then after applying paints on a surface then also there are reactions. So, unit processes are there, but paint manufacturing process only primarily it is all uh, you know kind of a you know unit operations involving mixing grinding kind of these kind of operations. So, now in this lecture we are going to start discussing paint manufacture. So, paint manufacture we as we said that it is mixing of a a uh, liquid vehicle and then uh, finely divided solid pigments. So, now the mixing has to be thorough efficient then only it will be proper uh, you know emulsion paint emulsion will form or suspension will form and then that suspension will stay longer for several years. What does mean by suspension staying longer for several years? That means that pigment particles should not settle down there, it should be in suspended conditions only in the liquid portion. Right. So, now if you do not have a proper mixing units or proper grinding units then your paint formulated uh, whatever is there that may not give the required characteristics. So, what is the point that I mean to stress on here is that the mixing is very essential part of uh, paint formulation and then mixing equipment as well as the grinding equipments depends on the type of pigments that are using. Whether it is dry and non-sticky pigment or if it is a you know uh, wet and sticky pigment. Similarly, liquid is like you know uh, viscous like resin ones or uh, non-viscous like uh, ketones kind of volatile components etc. The, based on those combinations the selection of uh, mixers and grinders should be done. Because if you do proper uh, grinding and proper uh, mixing then uh, operation is successful, paint formulation is going to be successful otherwise not, okay. So, now we are going to discuss about paint formulation through a flow chart as well. Paint manufacture, various unit operations are required to mix paints as we will be seeing subsequently. Chemical conversions are involved only in the manufacture of the constituents of paints as well as drying of the film. Let us say constituents you know pigments, pigments making or manufacturing of uh, pigments involved chemical processes, chemical reactions. So, we are going to see couple of you know uh, these things you know pigments manufacturing also today we are going to discuss, right. So, paint also constitutes liquid vehicles where we may need to have oils so that to enhance the fill forming nature of a given uh, suspension or to help in film forming, not only helping in film forming but also in aiding it to dry properly for that also oils are used and then proper drying is required. So, dryers are required then some kind of additives may also be required. So, then all these things you know when you make you know, there may be some kind of reaction. Let us say oils we have seen, bodying, bodying of oils yesterday we have seen. So, there are some reactions, 
different types of oils are used along with the liquid portion of the paints for different purposes as we have seen and then these oils usually not used as a kind of a pure form. They will be uh, passed through certain kind of a pre-treatment operations. One of them is like you know boarding of the oils etc. Then you know segregation, extraction etc. Those kind of things we have seen yesterday. Several options are there. So uh, there also some reactions are involved, right? Uh, pigments also uh, like you know we know that they are uh, you know something like ZNS plus BASO4 mixture that is zinc sulfide and then barium sulfate is known as the lithopone which is nothing but a, a kind of a white pigment. So in making of these pigments then there are some extenders. Extenders also in making of the extenders or manufacturing of extenders there are reactions. Reactions in the sense the chemical conversions or unit processes are involved prior to making the uh, paint or in the making of the constituents of the paints as well as the after making the paint when you apply for the drying of the film etc. also there are chemical reactions or unit processes are involved. But in the manufacturing of the paint we have only several types of unit operations as we are going to discuss. In the flow sheet that we will be seeing now, weighing, assembling and mixing of pigments and vehicles take place on the top floor. Mixer may be similar to a large dog kneader with sigma blades. So pictorial if you see actually it can be arranged in other side also. These are the things which are supposed to be present at the top floor. So that is pigments, oils, resins, sometimes tints and thinners are also required as per the requirement, right? So now let us say if your uh, liquid portion is a uh, viscous resin, then whatever the mixer that you are going to have uh, for the volatile ketones kind of uh, liquid uh, portion is not going to be working properly because resins are very viscous, ketones often are aldehydes etc. they are not that much viscous. Okay. Similarly, pigments if they are dry, non-sticky or uh, sticky kind of material, you know wet, these kind of things are also coming into the picture. So accordingly the mixers and then grinders should be chosen because these two are the important ones which are going to decide the success of the paint formulation, final product that you are going to get. So in general these uh, ingredients if at all you need additives also you can add them. Some kind of additives also need required. Let us say tins and thinners may be taken as a kind of additives as per the requirement. Sometimes you need to do pH control, sometimes you need to have some anti-foam agents kind of things. So many other uh, things may also require to have in the process, right? So here what we are trying to understand very generalized paint manufacture process. It is not specific to any particular type of uh, paint or colored etc. Very generic one, there may be a few additions may also be there, there may be some deletions may also be there from the flow chart whatever we have shown the things or unit operations here depending on the specific condition. This is very generalized one. So primarily pigments, oils, resins are the primary ingredients, uh, tints and thinners are optional ones. You can add uh, pH control agents or uh, anti-foam agents etc. as per the requirement. Then you weigh them and then take them to the feed tank, then weighing tank. You weigh as per the requirement, as per the weight, how much pigment should be there, how much uh, you know resin should be there. Accordingly you weigh them and then take them to the uh, mixer, right? So in this mixer, you know all these things are mixed thoroughly and then these tints and thinners sometimes you know not added directly. Uh, along with the uh, ingredients, they may be added later on also, right? So now here when you are doing mixing, you know mixing is a unit operations and then its efficiency cannot be 100% as well as any of the crushing size reduction equipment. So here mixers you are using depending on the you know selection of your mixer, how appropriate for a given combination of pigment and oil and resins, you know its performance will uh, depend, right? So obviously uh, everything will not be mixed up some may be non-dispersed, uh, you know, solids may be there, etc. So what you do after this mixes, everything you take to the grinding mills and then do the proper grinding, etc. Further if you required. Then you take to tinting and thinning tanks where uh, thinners, etc. may be added if required. Otherwise not, otherwise directly whatever the paint that has formed that will be taken to a 
uh, hopper or storage tanks where it can uh, store uh, thousands of liters of uh, final paint in a batch mode. Right? So, this paint will be taken to a belt conveyor which is facilitated with the filling machine. So, a required amount of paint may be 10 liters or 20 liters cans would be there and then this paint would be poured into those uh, cans in the filling machine range and then that will be passed to the next level where labeling of the material will be done as per the manufacturer company name etc. those labeling would be done. Right? So, and these two operations done on a belt conveyor one after other. So, finally labeled uh, product whatever is there that will be taken to the cartoon packaging and then followed by the shipping to the consumer or customers. Right? So, this is a very generalized paint manufacture process. There may be some additions, there may be some deletions of whatever we have shown here, but you know it is just to understand. Now, what you understand here? In this process there is no reaction at all. Is there any reaction? No, only you know a kind of grinding, mixing kind of things only undergoing here. So, now what we see now in this process, we can divide the process into two categories. One is the grinding and mixing or uh, steps up to the grinding and mixing and then steps after the mixing. Okay? So, that way we see now grinding and mixing of ingredients. Batch masses are conveyed to the floor below where grinding and further mixing take place types of pigments and then vehicles used are going to deciding factors in choice of grinding and then mixing equipment used for paint making. Right? So, if you have a, a sticky wet uh, pigment and then resinous uh, uh, liquid portion where, which is also sticky then you have to have a kind of a mixer where you know needle kind of mixers are very essential having simple batch kind of reactor and then stirrer mixing them is not going to give a proper mixing of such kind of sticky and then resinous uh, liquids. Right? So, that is what it means like if you have a dry pigment and then uh, very uh, volatile uh, liquid portion like ketones, aldehydes, etc., then you can have a simple uh, batch reactor kind of thing and then pour them together you have a stirrer and then stirrer different uh, rotations as per the requirements to get the required you know mixture that is possible. So, you know that is one and then also grinding also grinding sticky materials is very difficult right. If it is dry and then non-sticky kind of uh, ore then it can be easily crushed. If it is a, a like you know uh, sticky material then grinding them also is a very difficult. So, then what kind of grinder should you use? like ball mill, pebble mill, etc. those kind of things also come into the picture based on the choice of the pigments and then choice of the vehicles. Right? Choice of the grinder and then mixing equipment depends on the what kind of pigments and vehicles you are selecting. Right? Selection also you cannot select as per the grinding and mixing equipment that you are having. Selection of pigments and vehicles should be done as per the consumer's requirement right? and then based on the nature of these pigments and vehicles accordingly you have to uh, select the grinding and mixing equipment, but not the other way. Okay? One of the older methods is grinding or dispersion between two bus stones that is very conventional one, but uh, until recent past uh, grinding mills such as ball and pebble mills, steel roller mills were used, but nowadays so many advanced uh, equipment have come into the picture. So, what you see sand mills, high speed agitators and then high speed stone mills are being used increasingly to grind paint and enamels as well. Okay? Mixing and grinding of pigments in oil require much skills. Actually these are very viscous in general. right? Until when you have a crude emulsion where you have only pigments and then uh, liquids have been you know dispersed together and mixed together. So, then you get the crude emulsion it is very viscous, very viscous in general. So, you cannot have very viscous paint also. If you have very viscous paint let us say if you apply on a surface or on architectural structure what will happen? You know on drying it will form a very thick layer and then the layer if it is thick when it is drying it will be peeling out of the you know structure. So, it, uh, viscosity is very much essential for the paints uh, application point of view also. So, then you have to add uh, tinters or thinners etcetera in order to decrease the viscosity of this crude emulsions. 
right. So now when you have this uh, viscous material kind of thing, you know, you need lot of experience, right. You cannot have, you cannot expect everyone able to do it, okay. So in order to have a smooth product without too high a cost, then you need to have experienced persons to handle this mixing and grinding equipments in the plants. Post mixing operations, what we do? We usually farm paint is transferred to a next floor level where it is thinned and tinted in agitated tanks. These are the right, you know, in general required uh, for most of them but not necessarily for all of them, okay. These tanks may hold batches of several thousands of liters of uh, paint. Liquid paint is strained into a transfer tank or directly into a hopper of filling machine on the floor below. Then obviously as I said everything may not be dispersed properly because mixing also will not give 100 percent efficiency. There would be some kind of non-dispersed pigments in the emulsions. So then they should be separated. For the separation of those uh, non-dispersed pigments in general you use the screens, centrifuges or pressure filters etc. those are being used in general. Paint is poured into cans or drums labeled, packed and moved to storage after removing this non-dispersed pigments. So that is about paint manufacture, very generalized approach. So any paint you know that you are going to make, latex based paint or uh, emulsion based paints or you know enamels etc. whatever you make you have similar kind of flow charts only, right. So that is the reason we are not going into the details of each and every different types of uh, uh, paints individually. Right. However, uh, before completing this paint section what we will do, we will be having a discussion on how to make latex based paints or latex paints. Dispersant and ammonia are added to water in a pony mixer followed by pigments pre-mixed and ground in a ball mill. In this process actually again mixing only taking place. What happens here? You have the pigments, these pigments are uh, pre-mixed and ground in a ball mill, right. So, uh, pigments there may be 1 or 2, 3, 4, 5 also required sometime depending on application. So different types of pigments are pre-mixed and ground in a ball mill and they are added to a pony mixer, small mixer that means a batch type of mixer in which dispersant and ammonia are already added, right. Pigments and extenders that are used often are water dispersible grades of TiO2, ZNS, lithopone. These are actually white pigments to be frank, water based or water dispersible grades whatever this TiO2, ZNS and lithopone etc. are there, they are white pigments and regular grades of uh, barium sulphate, mica, diatomaceous silica, clay and magnesium silicate etc. are also used very often. Combination of 4 or 5 inert is in general employed as I mentioned. So it is not necessarily one single but in this combination of uh, many. Usual colored pigments may be used for tinting with certain exceptions such as Prussian blue, chrome yellow, chrome green and carbon black. Why exception to this? Because these three are found to be like you know very sensitive to alkalis and this usually breaks the emulsions. You do not want emulsion to be breaked, actually you want emulsion to be stable for years, okay. So Prussian blue, chrome yellow and then chrome green are sensitive to alkalis and then carbon black tends to break emulsion, that is the reason these are certain exception. You These are also used but as per the requirement wherever the certain applications are there and then they are uh, essential to add. So you add them and then appropriately you change modification in the process so that you know uh, breaking of emulsion may not take place. Let us say if you are making black paint, so carbon black is one of the pigment, you cannot avoid it, okay. So accordingly you have to make changes in the process. Also sodium free alkalis and pigments are preferred since they minimize effluence caused by sodium sulphate on the paint surface. Then film formers are added to the pigment dispersion followed by a preservative solution and antifoam as per the requirement. See now this all process like you know we are uh, mixing the pigments and then we are uh, grinding them and then we are pouring in a uh, reactor like you know pigments, premix, then grind, then take to a reactor in which already 
uh, dispersant, ammonia, etc., are present, right? So now this to this reactor, you can also add film forming agents or oils, etc. You can add. You can also add preservative solution and antifoam as per the requirement. So it's all mixing kind of operation is only going on until now. Preservative solutions are usually chlorinated phenols, whereas the antifoam agents are sulfonated tallow or pine oils. Latex emulsion is stirred slowly followed by water because these latex emulsions are in general viscous, in general very uh, viscous uh, in nature. So then you cannot uh, have a kind of a high speed agitators, etc. That is the reason you know these are mixed slowly in a pony mixers, batch type mixers. Pony in the sense small which indicating batch kind of uh, mixers. Paint is mixed then screened and mixed again before packing because uh, why screening? There may be some non-dispersive items that may be you know pigment, that may be a kind of uh, film forming agent or that may be antifoam agent or there may be preservative etc. whatever it may be. So some kind of screens may be required. So then you if at all anything is un, not dispersed properly that you remove and then you take it back to the mixer and then again mix before making packaging. So a typical paint consists of 35 percent pigment and filler and whereas the 21 percent is film forming ingredients. Latex paints required addition of thickness to allow paint to be spread satisfactorily. For specific purposes, other additives are also needed such as antifoam agents, antibacterial agent, pH adjusters, etc. these kind of things. Okay? This is very basic knowledge about the paint formulation, uh, normal paint formulation and uh, latex paint formulation, etc. Now, we cannot go into details of each and every paint because of the you know nature of the course and then has to be completed within stipulated time. So then what we do? We go to the next topic of uh, surface uh, coating industries that is pigments, right? So we understand then pigments is one of the most important constituent of any paint that you take. Any paint without pigments it is not possible. It is not possible to have a satisfactory emulsion without a proper pigments and the, these pigments are usually finely divided solids and then they provide different types of colors etc. as per the requirement. These pigments are dispersed in a or uh, formed emulsions in a uh, vehicle. Uh, vehicle may be volatile, non-volatile, resinaceous etc. all those things we have seen. Okay? So what are these pigments? What are their roles etc. these things we are going to see you now. Also we are going to see how to manufacture these pigments because naturally they are not available. You have to do such a uh, certain kind of processing. Okay? So pigments are colored organic and inorganic soluble substances used widely in surface coating industries. In fact, uh, without uh, having these pigments it is not possible to have paints. These are also employed in ink, plastic, rubber, ceramic, paper and linoleum industries to impart color, different types of colors, colored paper, different types of colored plastics or designed plastics, different types of colored uh, rubbers, designed rubbers, ceramics, etc. There also you know you need these pigments, right? Ceramics again next week we are going to study about the ceramics, there again we may be having uh, role of uh, these pigments again. Large number of pigments and dyes are consumed because different products required a particular choice of material to give a maximum coverage, economy, opacity, color, durability, desired reflectance. You see so many things are there. These many activities or these many requirements are there from the pigments point of view in the surface coating industry. In fact, almost all of them, you know, whatever the requirements are then, whatever the expectation that you have from a surface coating industry product, all of them, almost all of them are coming from these pigments. Whereas the liquid or vehicles, you know, they are kind of vehicles to uh, form emulsions of these pigments only, okay? Including the opaque nature, including the reflectance, durability, color, coverage, everything is coming because of these pigments and dyes only, okay? Once the principal white pigments used were lead, zinc oxide, lithopan, these were very famous once upon a time. We will study about white lead in the section where we talk about white pigment. Nowadays titanium oxide in many varieties is almost the only white pigment used. 
right? Earlier all these zinc, zinc oxide, zinc sulphate, lead, lithopone, etc. were used, but nowadays primarily titanium oxide is only TiO2 is used in uh, many varieties to have this white pigment are used in the paint industries. Lead pigments were formerly of major importance, however these are now prohibited by laws for many uses because of the loss of a given country these lead pigments are not being used because of their impact on the environment as well as the inhabitant as well as the painter as well. Colored pigments consisted of Prussian blue, lead chromate, various iron oxides and a few lake colors as well. So now what we see? We see ingredients and functions of uh, different types of pigments and extenders. First we start with the pigments, right? Pigments now they are the ones they are providing opacity, color, uh, reflectance or you know resistance to the re, uh, reflectance, durability, etc. Right? So what are these uh, pigments? Right? When you are talking about the color, so then each type of color if you need to have, so then certain types of pigments are there. Right? So like why? Like that way we group these pigments. Right? Let us say ingredients of the pigments, you have a white hiding pigment, so what are the things? Then similarly if you wanted to have a black pigments, black color, uh, blue pigments, so then what are the constituents like orange pigments, red pigments, yellow pigments, green pigments, brown pigments and metal protective pigment etc. all these things are there. Right now we have already seen the functions of these pigments but however again uh, presented here these pigments are used to protect film by reflecting destructive ultraviolet light and to strengthen the film and to impart an aesthetic appeal and then pigments should possess particular properties, those things are requirements of pigments also. We have seen basic requirements, they should be opaque, opacity, good covering power, they should have wettability by oil because oils are essential part of the paint. And then if these uh, pigments, though majority of the characteristics of the paints are coming through pigments, if these pigments are not wettable by the oil or liquid portion or vehicle of the paints then that is not going to be useful anyway. So the wettability by oil has to be there, then they should be chemically inert, right? So when you apply these uh, paints on a surface, if they are uh, chemically active, so then they may uh, destroy or destruct the surface itself. So they should be chemically inert and then they should not be toxic. They should be completely non-toxic if possible, if not possible at least they should be low toxic and then they should be low cost or reasonable cost. So these uh, functions as well as the basic requirements, basic characteristics of the pigments, those things we have seen. These are very common for all of the different types or different colors of pigments, right? However, each pigment providing a different color. Right. Let us say if you wanted to have a white hiding pigment then you should uh, use titanium dioxide pigments or zinc oxide or lithopone or uh, zinc sulphide or antimony oxides you have to use. Let us say if you wanted to have a black color then uh, carbon black, lamp black, graphite, iron blacks are useful. Likewise for uh, a blue color, blue pigments like such as ultramarine, copper thalocyanine, and then iron blues are required. In order to impart orange color, orange pigments are required which include like you know basic lead chromate, cadmium orange, molybdenum orange, etc. Likewise, if you need to impart red color, then uh, red pigments such as red lead, iron oxide, cadmium red, toner and lakes, metallics, aluminum, zinc dust, bronze powder, etc. are used. If you prefer to have yellow color in the paint, then yellow pigments are going to be uh, useful such as litharge, ochre, lead or zinc chromate, Hansa yellows, ferrite yellows, cadmium, lithopone, etc. If you wish to have a green color in the paints, then green pigments such as chromium oxide, chrome green, hydrated chromium oxide, thalocyanin green, permansa greens are used in general. Similarly, to have a brown color, brown pigments, something like a burnt sienna, burnt umber, van dyke brown, etc., are used. Likewise, if you wanted to have metal protective 
pigments then uh, red lead, blue lead, zinc, basic lead and barium, potassium, chromates etc are used, right. So, based on the color, so not only the color based on the other uh, required properties also you have to uh, select appropriate uh, you know uh, pigments for the paint formulation. Now you see different colored pigments 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 only shown here. There may be many more, there may be a combination of these also. Nowadays different color patterns are there, they are neither fall in one particular color or not the other color, it may be in between of these two. So then mixture of uh, colors, uh, pigments are required. So uh, n number of combinations are possible. And then within each of them there are several different types of uh, pigments are there. So manufacturing of each and every pigment is not at all possible for us. So now what we do? Since we cannot uh, discuss manufacturing process of each and every pigment, as a learning process we try to understand you know manufacturing of uh, lithopon white hiding pigment as well as the titanium dioxide white pigment we are going to discuss in detail. Now before going to the manufacturing process of white pigments what we will have, we will have a discussion on the extenders or inerts as well and their functions. Their functions also we have already seen, we have seen that they reduce the cost of pigments because some of the pigments what you see there almost all of them are uh, chemicals, solids chemical solids and then finely divided solids, right. So they may be expensive, some of them may be very expensive, right. So if you have some kind of extenders or inert which may not uh, decrease the quality of the product but decrease the cost of the overall paint or pigment, it is going to be very useful. So one of the role of these extenders or inert is to reduce the pigment cost, to increase the covering and weathering power of pigment by complementing pigment particle size and thus improving consistency, leveling and settling, right. For these purposes extenders or inerts are used. So what are the common types of extenders or inerts? China clay, talc, asbestos, silica and silicates, whiting, metal stearates, gypsum, mica, barite, barium sulphate, blank fix, etc. These kind of extenders are used. There may be many other types are also possible. Now we discuss about white pigments. Some of the white pigments are titanium oxide, zinc oxide, lithopone, zinc sulphide, antimony oxide, etc. Oldest and formerly most important white pigment is white lead. However, nowadays it is not used uh, as a constituent in most of the paint industries because of certain restrictions. Zinc oxide is another white pigment formerly used and it is now only a minor importance, right? Because so many different types are being produced uh, gradually and then older ones may be supplanted by the newer ones in general, okay? Titanium oxide is the most important white pigment which is available in two crystalline uh, forms, anatase and then rutile. Now what we do? We take a conventional uh, white lead and then older zinc oxide and then presently used uh, titanium oxide in two different forms and then compare their properties. If you take the refractive index, refractive index of TiO2 is higher compared to the remaining two. Similarly, average particle size also you know it is uh, within the control compared to the other two ones. White lead particle size is very high, 1 micron in general. Whereas the density also if you see it is low density compared to the uh, ZNO and then white lead. Okay, if its density is higher, what will happen? Emulsion may not be stable, it may settle, particle may be settled in quicker time, rather in two years it may be settling in one year only. So we, after one year you cannot use that uh, emulsion in general. So density has to be low as much as possible. So that way TiO2 is better compared to the previous ones. Oil absorption characteristics also you see, the TiO2 oil absorption characteristics are better. And then uh, relative hiding power also if you see this TiO2 they are having high power. So individually TiO2 also anatase and rutile if you compare rutile is found to be better from these numbers mostly from all these characteristics point of view. That is refractive index, average particle size, density and then oil absorption, how many grams of oil per 100 grams of pigment is required 
from that point also and then the relative hiding power point of view also this rutile is better because it is more stable compared to the anatase. But anyway, you can get the rutile from the anatase as well by heating it at high temperature. So those things we are going to see anyway. Now we talk about the manufacturing of lithopone. It is mixed zinc sulphide and barium sulphate pigment that contains about 30 percent zinc sulphide remaining is barium sulphate. Original light sensitiveness has been overcome by raw material purification and by adding agents such as polythenates and cobalt sulphate etc. Lithopone is a brilliantly white, extremely fine, cheap white pigment particularly well adapted to interior coatings. From the production point of view, if you take uh, 1 ton of lithopone as basis, the barites which are nothing but uh, barium sulphate ores, you need 0.85 tons. Then zinc ore, you need 0.4 tons, coal you need 1.1 tons, sulfuric acid 0.5 tons, electricity 400 megajoule you required. Now this is the flow chart that is used for making finished lithopone, right? So now it is uh, what we are having as per the raw material that barites, ores are there, coal is there and then zinc also there, zinc ore is also there, right? So all these things are individually processed, right? You know the processing is also indicated by the different lines. For example, barites are taken, crushed and grinded. Similarly, coal is also crushed and grinded, pulverized coal is taken and then these are added together in a mixer or they are individually taken to a furnace. First before taking to the furnace they can be individually mixed and then send the mixture to the furnace or individually they can be taken to a furnace where the required reaction takes place and then you get barium sulphate. It is coming from uh, ore is having barium sulphate and then when it reacts with this one you get a barium sulphide from this reaction. So that mixture whatever the uh, from the furnace whatever the product is there that you take to a agitator, right? So from the agitator you mix these contents of the product whatever are there thoroughly you mix them and then the product mixture you send to thickeners. These are nothing but the thickener. Thickeners are you know settling chambers kind of thing. You see in mechanical unit operations this uh, settling tanks or sedimentation tanks etc. you might have studied. So these sedimentation tanks can be continuous and batch. Now here we are having a continuous one. So what happens? The heavy particles are you know when you are doing crushing so all size of particles may be there. You may have the proper screens before sending them to the furnace. Even then also some kind of oversize or undersize would be there. So heavier particles, bigger size would be collected from the bottom and then they would be sent to a second thickener where again the same process is being done. Right? So large particle or mud etc. those things are not required they will be taken as a solids to waste whereas the overflow which are the required ones they will be sent back to the agitator again. Right? From the first thickener whatever the product is there that will be taken to a precipitating tank to which zinc sulphate solution is added. So here from where is it coming? It is coming from the desulphurized zinc ore. Right? Zinc ore and then H2SO4 react together to get the zinc sulphate ZnSO4. Right? So from here whatever the solids which are not you required for the process they will be taken to the waste whereas the zinc sulphates etc. would be taken to the iron precipitation units and then the product from this iron precipitation units will be taken to a filter press. There are two filter press are there. So after doing the filtration whatever the solids, cakes etc. are there you can collect them as solids to waste whereas the filtrate that you take to heavy metals precipitations to which zinc dust may be added if required otherwise not. After adding this zinc dust in a heavy metals precipitation whatever the final precipitate is coming that will be again sent to another uh, filter press. Here again the cake final uh, solid cake whatever is there that is taken as a waste whatever the filtrate is there that filtrate is nothing but the ZnSO4 solution. 
that ZnSO4 solution is coming to the precipitating tank to which we are sending barium sulphide solution anyway. So now here the required reaction takes place and then you get barium sulphate plus zinc sulphide mixture you get from here from the below of this precipitating tank. So that mixture is taken to series of thickeners. We are showing one or two only depends on the requirements. So again here thickeners when you do the processing you know here now final uh, precipitate whatever this that is the product earlier in this thickness the other side around. So here final precipitate solution slurry whatever is there that is the product that you take to another filter right filter press again you try to uh, remove the so called the filtrate whatever the solids are there or uh, the cakes are that formed in the filter press those cakes are taken to a dryer. So then these are nothing but the required BASO4 plus ZNS mixture only that you are getting after this drying. So these are crushed and then passed through muffle furnace again if required and then quenching is done. After this they will be sent to you know mills, hydro separators etc, thickness etc as per the requirement and then dried finally disintegration of this uh, because all these processes are occurring so the lumps of the particles may be taking place or they may be forming a kind of lumps. So those uh, lumps would be disintegrated and then sent to the bolters followed by the packing of a lithopone. So this lithopone is forming here only as a product BASO4 and then ZNS after this uh, thickener unit coming after the precipitating tank. So here itself the product is there but all this uh, remaining step here is that purification step. Now here you see uh, it is a pigment making or manufacturing of a pigment. Now you see so many reactions were involved here right and then followed by the purification steps. Whereas in the paint formulations there are no reactions only mixing grinding and mixing operations were there or maybe separation of non dispersed pigments are maybe there but there are no reactions okay. So this looks very big but sequence wise you know if you see like you know if you already processed barium sulphate and processed zinc sulphide you are having so then all these steps may not be required if you are already having them. Directly you can take to the uh, precipitation tank followed by thickener and then followed by the purification etc steps you can follow. This is all not required if you directly have a pure uh, BASO4 and then ZNS. If you are trying to get this BAS and then ZNSO4 from their corresponding O's then only all these steps are required. So whatever we have seen in the previous slides you know same thing is uh, provided as a text here for understanding for learning process. Barium, zinc and lithopone circuits are represented by different types of lines. Some are the dotted lines, lines some of them are you know thick lines we have seen. Barium sulphide solution is prepared by reducing barite ore which is majorly consisting barium sulphate with carbon and leaching the resulting mass by the reaction BASO4 plus 4C giving rise to BAS plus 4CO right. So this is the processing of a barite ore, now zinc ore processing that we are seeing now. Scrap zinc or concentrated zinc ores are dissolved in H2SO4 and then solution purified as shown in the uh, flow chart. Then two solutions are reacted and a heavy mixed precipitate results which is having 28 to 30 percent of ZNS and then 70 to 72 percent barium sulphate right as per the reaction that is ZNSO4 reacting with BAS to give ZNS and then BASO4. This is nothing but the lithopone okay. This precipitate is not suitable for pigment until it is filtered using filter press then dried then crushed then heated in a muffle furnace to high temperature then quenched in a cold water all these steps we have seen in the flow chart. Without doing these purification steps this is not going to be useful as a pigment. Chemically it is the same composition ZNS and BASO4 mixture but in order to have or in order to bring pigment uh, basic requirements in this mixture you have to do all these steps as well. Second heating in muffle furnace at 725 degrees centigrade produces crystals of right optical size. Now we talk about titanium dioxide pigment okay, it is also white pigment. 
It is the most important white pigment nowadays used in most of the paint industries. It is available in two crystalline forms, anatase and rutile. Rutile is more stable and then almost all TiO2 used in paints is this type. However, you can get uh, rutile from the anatase also by heating it to 800 or 900 degrees centigrade. Anatase can be converted to rutile by heating to higher temperature like 700 to 950 degrees centigrade. It is widely employed in exterior paints, also in enamels and lacquers. Typical exterior white paint contains about 60 percent of pigment. Out of this 60 percent pigment, 20 percent is TiO2, 60 percent is talc and 20 percent is mica. These are you know not exactly the same one, there may be slightly variations or may be there plus or minus 2 to 5 percent may also be there in general from one paint industry to the other paint industry. Such a formulation has long life through controlled chalking and presents a good surface for subsequent repainting. So, what is the chalking? It is a layer of loose pigment powder on the surface of the paint film which acts as a self cleaner for the paint. Okay? Now, about 50 percent of this pigment is consumed in paints, varnishes and lacquers. About 23 percent is used in paper industry. Another important use of this uh, TiO2 is in the coloring of plastics, right? So, these are the end uses, uses of or economics of a, a TiO2. Coming to the methods of production, there are two important methods of production. One is the sulphate process, another one is the chloride process. Sulphate process is the older process whereas the chloride process is a newer one. So, we start with sulphate process. Raw materials. Ilmenite is used as raw material which is cheaper and then as I mentioned this process is a older process. In addition to ilmenite, you also need sulfuric acid and water. Then chemical reactions, this ilmenite which is having TiO2 ore reacts with H2SO4, it will give TiOSO4 plus hydrated iron sulphate. Okay? This TiOSO4 uh, further reacts with uh, water to give hydrated TiO2. This hydrated TiO2 if you heat it to higher temperature to 800 to 1000 degrees centigrade, then you get a TiO2 pigment. Now, we discuss process of uh, TiO2 manufacture or TiO2 pigment manufacture using sulphate process through this flow chart. Here what we have, we have several number of digesters, these are nothing but digesters, only three have been shown, they can be in dozens, right? So, here sulfuric acid and then ilmenite ore which is containing 47 percent TiO2 after crushing, size reduction, crushing, drying and then washing all those things you do and then you take that ore in a digester to which sulfuric acid is being added, right? To these digesters, scrap iron is also added which is acting as reducing agent. Right? So, n number of uh, are there in a sequence, the product coming out of the one digester is going to the next one like this, it is keep on going on. Right? So, now here what happens? In this process what you get? TiOSO4 plus FeSO4 H2O you are getting. Right? So, after passing all the digesters, whatever the product mixture that you are getting from the last digester that is taken to a separator where unreacted ilmenite if at all is there that would be separated and then that would be recycled to the first digester along with the sulfuric acid again. Then product mixture is taken to settler where undissolved solids in the mixture if at all undissolved suspending solids are there, they will be removed. Then that mixture is taken to a uh, crystallizer settler where this hydrated iron sulphate is separated out and then remaining TiO SO4 whatever is there that is taken to a hydrolyzer so that this reacts with water to give TiO2 or hydrated TiO2 would be given and then it would be a kind of slurry so then filter would be there. So, whatever the filter uh, is there when this mixture or the hydrated TiO2 is there when you pass it through filter. So, whatever the acids etcetera are there, they will be collected as spent acids and then mixed with the 
sulfuric acid and then sent to the sequence of digesters. Whereas the hydrated TiO2 would be calcined to high temperature like 700 to 900 degree centigrade to get the TiO2 pigment of proper optical size. Okay? So, this is the process. Now, coming to this reaction, these reactions whatever occurring between ilmenite and then H2SO4, they are very violent and then you know lot of uh, fumes are forming. So, H2SO4 etc. may be going out along with the you know water vapors. So, that is very dangerous. So, then that reaction may be controlled if you use the dilute acid or spent acid in the process. Okay? This is about the sulphate process to get TiO2 pigment. Description of the process uh, is given whatever we have seen in flowchart the same description is given here. It is a batch ore digestion process wherein concentrated H2SO4 is reacted with ilmenite. This reaction is very violent and causes the entrainment of sulphur oxides as well as the H2SO4 in large amounts of water vapor as well. Right? So, in previous days they used to be uh, discarded as it is, but however it is not possible because of the environmental pollution constraints or restrictions. So, then this has to be treated. So, for that purpose large number of scrubbers are being installed to reduce the particulate emissions from these water vapors. Okay? But these have necessitated treatment of large quantities of scrubbing liquid before discharge as well that also increase the cost of the plant operation as well as the installment both. Other waste disposal problem products are spent sulfuric acid and then copperase that is FeSO4 7H2O. This can be used in the process again because if you are used the dilute or spent sulfuric acid this violent nature of the reaction would decrease. right? And then this can be used to recover the iron sulphate. By using dilute sulfuric acid, violent reaction can be tempered, reduction of water vapor and trained particulates can also be achieved and then spent acid can also be recycled. Now before closing today's lecture, we will be discussing chloride process to get TiO2 pigments. Chloride process has largely supplanted older sulphate process. It uses more expensive ore rutail. Rutail is more expensive though it is stable. It is stable because it has been processed through a calcination section at high temperature, so it has become stable. So, when you do additional processing then obviously cost will increase. So, that is the reason it requires more expensive ore rutile. Ilmenite can be converted to synthetic rutile. Chemical reactions included in this chloride process are rutile which is having TiO2 that reacts with the hot chlorine gas and then coke to give chlorides of titanium. Titanium tetrachloride you get it. right? So, this titanium tetrachloride will be oxidized to give titanium oxide and then hot chlorine gases again which can be recycled. Process flowchart we will see here. Now, in this process we have different section chlorinating ore and then removing sublimates and then distillation, flame reaction, chlorine recovery, degassing and neutralization sections are there. So, here chlorine plus coke whatever is there that is taken to a reactor. right? In this reactor what will have? Again they will be mixed together and then they will be sent to a another reactor where removing of sublimates are being done. Here you know this Cl2 C and then this rutile will react together. This rutile or titanium slag can be used here. So, when you do it here, so what you get? You get TaCl4 as per the reaction, but there would be some impurities also. Liquid metal chlorides would be taken here and then there will be a, some kind of distillation would be done. Distillation to remove impurities, impurities from the liquid metal chlorides whatever are there they will be removed by the distillation and then after removing these impurities you have almost pure titanium tetrachloride. So, that will be oxidized using a flame reaction where the flame gases are coming and then uh, oxygen is coming and then when do the combustion the flames are forming. When this TaCl4 passes through these flames what happens oxidation will take place and then 
hot gases of chlorine will be collected and then recycle, recycle chlorine to the initial chlorinating ore section. Whereas the bottom products or the solids from here you are nothing but TiO2 that is titanium dioxide they will be processed to degassing and neutralization and then once the neutralization has been done titanium pigments are collected as the process. Now the success of this process depends on the flame reaction how effectively it is being implemented based on that one it depends. Steps of this chlorinated process are provided here. Treatment of natural or synthetic rutile with chlorine and coke produces titanium tetrachloride. This is distilled to remove impurities if at all present, obviously they will be present. Purified titanium tetrachloride reacted with oxygen or air in a flame at about 1500 degrees centigrade so that oxidation of this TiCl4 takes place and TiO2 produced. This reaction produces chlorine and very fine particle TiO2. Chlorine is recycled whereas the very fine particulate TiO2 is there that is collected as a product after degassing and neutralization. Waste products problem is there in both sulfonated process as well as this process as well. But here in this process waste products are easier to dispose than those formed by the sulphate process. Sulphate process spent H2SO4 are being formed, you cannot throw them easily, right? So such problem is not here in this process. References for this particular lecture are provided here, but however the entire lecture is prepared from this book Chemical Process Industries by Austin and Shreve, 5th edition. Thank you. Thank you.